Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> you'll uh, know by the sound of the wolves that Heidi May has thrown me to them once again. That's not true. In the form of another podcast. Yay! We are. Yeah. Henry, uh, what? I, I, you're I was, excited to I be was here. waiting for the wolves to come back. <laughs> I, I'm not exactly excited. I, I'm kind of wary. I'm like the wolf, Heidi. I never come that close to the campfire because I just never know what I'm going to get. You know what? This podcast is like a box of chocolates because you, you never know what you're going to get. That, wow, that wolf's having a bad time. And so um, enough, enough of this like wolfing business. And uh, that hum you hear in the background is because Heidi can't stand uh, no air conditioning. And so if you uh, start hearing, mm, no, that's not the sound of my voice. It's the sound of the air conditioner. Hello, Heidi May. Hello, Henry. You know, if I get too hot, I throw up. <laughs> Jeez. It's true. Wow. <laughs> But it's true. It just was how pleasantly you said it. You know, when I get too hot, I throw up. <laughs> and what have you, uh, as far as vomiting, what have you threatened to do to me many times in my life? Throw up you, on you like a fly. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's, isn't it sad? Or maybe it's amazing, Heidi May, that I remember all these things. You and I, we're doing the time <laughs> and we're doing the miles. And right now we're... Doing this podcast, dear podcast listener, if you just just in case you are tuning into this free podcast for the first time, uh, you will notice the low tech aspect of it. And we bring in sound effects by just turning up the stereo and pointing the microphones towards the speakers, and then turning them back. Um, you'll also know that the podcast is comprised of basically Heidi May hurling a topic at me. And me uh, recounting what I know as best I can. And so uh, I don't know what I'm in for. And so Heidi. So today I was thinking. Yeah, you're always well, this thinking. is actually your idea. Always thinking you all. You said this in our last podcast. Yeah. I thought we would talk about my war. Okay. Yeah. The recording of my war. So let's well, go. Let's see. There's a lot. Uh, there's a lot to take in with that album. Um, here's one thing people should know about My War: is a lot of those songs were written in 1982, and we came back from the 1982 Black Flag tour, which ended July 6th in San Luis Obispo. There was one last show, like two weeks later, somewhere inland. Uh, the last show with Emil, the drummer, and then almost immediately in comes Chuck Biscuits. And that was a very powerful lineup with two guitars, Des and Greg Ginn, and the amazing Chuck Biscuits on drums, who is just frightening. He's just amazing. And that, uh, by September of 82, I think it was late August, early September of 82, Black Flag went into a studio for like a one-day session and just did all the new songs, like one or two takes, boom, mixed onto cassette, never a full mix, just a quick mix onto cassette uh, by Spot. And that that's the the Black Flag bootleg of the 83, 82 recordings. So anyway, um, a lot of the songs on My War, like the song My War, it's, it's older than you think. And so this is an really interesting songwriting period for Greg Ginn, who is in that time just going from strength to strength in that songs are falling out of this guy. And he'd come up with a, yet another lyric sheet. And he'd sit down and he'd, you'd be holding the lyrics and he'd play the, you know, the guitar unplugged and he'd kind of like say the words in the right places. You go, okay. And he would just, it was like almost every day he's handing you another lyric sheet. And also Chuck Dukowski was writing as well. So you have these two extraordinarily talented people. I don't know if they're at their artistic peak. It's not for me to say, but they are definitely 
in this moment where both of them are cranking out these really memorable songs as far as black flag goes songs that people still talk about like my war uh modern man stuff like that and so that was 82 and so we made the demo and by february 83 march sorry february february march 83 black flag went on tour I think it was the last tour with Dukowski on bass and Des on second guitar. And the set was uh, the song I Love You, Black Coffee. Uh, I think My War was in there. And you, a lot of those songs were just kind of in the set, much to the, the anger of the audience who has, they have never heard them. And so the audience wants TV party, no value, six pack, etc. And they're getting all these new songs, including a couple of new Dez songs. And, and so they're getting a really good set of music, but they, they've never heard it. And in the ethos of Black Flag, it's like on with the new no matter what. And the audiences were not always very happy about that. And so that was that was interesting. And they I, let you know it? Well, yeah. So, some just you know didn't like us because we were American, but you know some were yelling like six pack. You know those songs are great, but we, I remember we we did we did have a handful of the old songs, but Greg was all about moving on to the next thing, and I I really like that. And he just he was really into letting the chips fall where they may, and like here's the new stuff, like let's go because we're gonna write even more and more and more. We got to keep moving, and I, I like that ethos. So anyway, the point I'm making is those songs might be older than you know and i think there's that's interesting just to kind of give you a read on the development of that band's music where like you thought it was new songs by the time we recorded my war they weren't new songs anymore they were very well played and so in that period of time chuck dukowski left black flag and there was an interim of no bass player before Kira came in. And that's when we got to work laying down the basic tracks for what became the My War album. And that's why you see a guy named Dale Nixon, uh, the bass player on My War. And I, I, I'm not talking out of class. I think everybody knows it by now. Dale Nixon is, is actually Greg Ginn. And so the rhythm tracks were laid down by Bill and Greg. Greg, I think he was very new to bass at that point, just picked up the bass and said, here we go. And it gives the record a really interesting sound because Greg is not a bass player's bass player. He's a very able musician who picked up a bass and obviously knows his way around an instrument but he's not the guy who's been playing a bass since he was, you know, in 10th grade. And so the fact that those guys laid down the rhythm tracks without a guitar player playing, because Greg can't be in two places at once, without a singer singing, the record, it's, it's like four people playing separately. There's a real kind of strange isolationist, POV with that record. And so we made the record at a place called Total Access, which was local. We were all living in Redondo and Hermosa. And I think uh, Total Access is in Redondo or Hermosa. I'll, I'll, I'll remember it by in the next few minutes, uh, which, which beach it was at. We liked Total Access because for a lot of reasons, it was cheap. Spot, our, our venerable producer, had a good relationship with total access and would let basically let us in there late at night. Um, and we, we could go in there and record from midnight till like eight in the morning, which was all we could afford. And so they would basically the, the real musicians, you know, bands who were paying top rate, they'd leave around 10 or 11 and they would basically throw the keys to spot because spot can run a studio. I mean, super engineer can build one. And so we were just given the keys and we would re record overnight until like they would come in at 9 a.m. to open the studio and you'd come staggering forth into rush hour traffic, just dazed and confused. And for me, quite often I was 
working construction. So I would like leave a recording session and go meet D Boone of the Minutemen and help build a house. And so I was like cross-eyed from exhaustion. But those are the hours we could afford. And so I think the basic tracks were laid down very, very quickly. Uh, th this, this will become interesting it, it, quickly. But um, we, Greg and, and Bill laid down the rhythm tracks fast. And then it comes time for the guitars and the vocals. And so Spot would come and pick me up from the Gins place around 11 or so. And just the two of us together. No one else, because, you know, who, who cares? His spot will, you know, groom the vocals. So, Greg, no one else is needed. And it would just be the two of us at total access working until, you know, whatever my voice would give out. And we, I would just sing and yell and we do take after take. Uh, and I'm forgetting if spot was like the taskmaster or if I was, but we would just get in these grooves where we, I would just go for, you know, a few hours and then the voice finally just keels over and we go, okay, that's a wrap. And we'd do some other, you know, tape business and then leave. But I guess I came in after Gin had done all his guitar. So I was kind of the last guy in there going night after night. So anyway, one night we went in really late. I think it was, yeah, it was, I think it was the My War Sessions. Because we, we recorded quite a bit in that studio because we always got a good rate there. Like a lot of black, most of the Black Flag records when I was singing were recorded at total access because they would record, the band would record like, because Greg had so many songs, they would record multiple albums at a time. Like they would just hit me with a cassette of like 15 instrumental tracks and go, there you go. Because they just had so much music. Because Bill would also write songs. And Kira would also write songs. And so there was just like these very creative people. Everyone had an idea and everyone is playing everyone else's idea. But the, the brief anecdote, I, we went in there one night to do the late night, you know, hell session and Wasp was recording <laughs> there and they were doing demos. And for us, it's a full price studio for them with a Capitol records recording budget. It's a demo studio. And you really got that like wow we are so hanging on by like a thread and these guys like yeah our demos and they're gonna they're gonna throw these songs out they're, they'll never get used and for us it's our next record and everyone in wasp there's the, you know they talked about it in their in their press release everyone in the band is over six feet tall really yes all of them and they're like these towering guys. Wow. And, you know, a lot of attitude, you know, big, big, you know, big personalities. And it's the 80s and like, you know, big, just big, big men. And we would, we kind of passed them once in the lobby. And they looked down at us and we're like, you know, <laughs> we're Black Flag. <laughs> <laughs> like, we are Wasp and that this is our demo <laughs> studio. And like, Wow. I think I just, I think I'm six inches shorter. I think you just felt like such a chump. Because like, aren't you the guy who like chews raw meat on stage and throws a steak at the audience? Like, and like, you're totally just like blowing me off as you walk by. I mean, you were totally reminded of your place in the universe. But did you ever talk with them? No, no. But I, I, I've been told they were very nice people. I mean, it was very cordial, but you like, you were like, wow, those are big men. <laughs> I mean, it was, they were very impressive. Anyway. Did they have uh, on their gear? No, but they're just, you're like, wow, you are really damn tall. So anyway, um, Spot and I, you know, we're just two crazy characters. I mean, Spot's just a nut. You know, and I mean that in the most affectionate way. He's a hyper-talented, super-intelligent guy. Can play like any stringed instrument, like a wicked banjo player. Just like insanely talented. Anyway, he and I would just get really bent out of shape in those sessions. Like just, just two people <laughs> wired on coffee alone in a studio. I don't even think we had a tech there. Just like two of us because Spot can run the whole thing. But like you mean slap happy? Yeah, because you just get punchy after yeah. a few hours. And you're like, and he's like, okay, let's record the vocal for this in the lobby. And we would just run a mic line out. <laughs> and I think it's after the song either scream or three nights. You can easily just, just find it, just go to the last several seconds of one of the songs on side two. And you'll hear at the end, that's the Coke machine turning on. 
That's amazing. Yeah, because we were out like by the front door and the Coke machine. <laughs> and I was just out there and you'll hear, it's, it's the song Scream. And you'll hear squeaking. And that's me, I think, slamming myself into the couch. So I've got, I, I would take a t-shirt, take the neck part, put it around the headphones and tie the sleeves around my head to, to strap the headphones to my head. Because you flail around. Well, because I, I handhold a Shure 58 microphone. You can't put me in front of a mic stand because I, I have to move right. when I sing because it has to feel real. I have to forget I'm in a studio. And I have made every record I've ever made as a guy in a band that way. Like we found that out on the damage sessions. Like we, he can't sit still. He's missing the mic. So it was spot. I said, just hold, hold a mic. And I've always recorded that. I've never been able to to stand in front of a mic and sing because I'm not a singer. And so they have this insanely long headphone lead line and this long mic line. And I'm alone in the lobby of Total Access running into stuff, screaming. <laughs> and at the end, he'd, he'd open the door. He's like, you want, you want to do another one? I'm like, yeah. Like, why not? It's three in the morning. Like, well, let's, let's just do it. And I it got to the point where I'm like making up new lyrics and he'd, he'd come in and go, what did you just say? I'm like, I don't know. Was it any good? He's like, no, <laughs> like just again, like, and get it right. Cause now we're just like, you're like, we, and no one knows this stuff. Cause there's a spot and I, and we'd come back at some ruined hour of the morning with like a song or two done you know, we didn't have the money, the luxury of doing like a song a night, which I I love doing. I just sing the hell out of a song. Thank you. Good night. I'm going to go sleep my voice into a better condition. We were like ganging them up. And the um, I'll never forget the night I did my war. And that was like that for us. That was our the song. It's a Dukowski song. And, you know, this one of the best moments of Black Flag. It's just one of the best songs I've ever heard. I'm just happy I get to be in it but as just a fan i mean what a tour de force of a song like the riff the playing and live is like that thing like you see it on the set list and like i'd look at bill he'd look at me like okay yeah because <laughs> it's like you know here's like the manifesto like is this is our national anthem was it your favorite song to play live yeah well, it was this it was the most hectic because you just had to see if you could survive it because we must play this song and almost die playing it we just had this thing in our mind that this song must try and like end <laughs> everything <laughs> and you know that thing at the end doo, 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 doo. if you don't yell loud enough you must go out and beat yourself with a stick you know and so i remember i i think either spot or bill came over to the gins early like, you know, okay, man, you're going to go in and do, sing my war tonight. Like, okay. And like, you know, like pass the sacred torch, like get out the the skull and light the candle and read the sacred verses. It was like a big deal. <laughs> and I think that's the night we only did the one song because we're just going to sing it for like four hours just to get the ultimate and like no pressure. And we, it was so weird. We ended up, you know, and I just, you know, did my thing with it, you know, whatever, sang. And, um, we got it done, and then in the final mix, the last lyric is this: the two words, my war. You know, da -na -na -na, my war, and that's the end of the song. If you hear the end, you hear my, my war, because Spot took two different takes, and he took like the my from one take and the war from the other, but he didn't sync it up to where you get, he should have, chopped it or like muted it so you get my from one take in war it's called comping and it's nothing i like doing i like using like full takes and just let the warts show but um you know he comped it but he comped it strangely and i remember hearing the mix and i looked at spot i went but you there's two my's in it and he just looked at me and went eh. i'm with spot i love stuff like that but it but it's not a it's not like a, a the singer made a mistake it's an engineering error. I don't think it adds to the song. Just what I'm saying, if you've ever heard the that song and wondered why, that was on spot, and he never, I'm not trying to run spot down, but he never said, here's why I did it. He kind of went, yeah, who cares? <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. And no one has ever said to me, 
what's up with that? The two mys at the end of my war. But as the guy in the band singing, I'm like, oh, it just it, it's all I remember. And so um, it was a really interesting process of making that record. And we never recorded that way again with like Greg playing bass, as far as I know. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, otherwise, it was just... Um, I just hung up on someone. <laughs> yeah. Who knows who that would have been? I don't know. Do I have a, anything I need to do? No, you're good. Keep going. Okay, well, <laughs> um, as far as I can remember, that was the only time we recorded with Greg playing bass and Bill playing drums. Because after that, I, I think it was Kira. Kira was right in after that. Like when we released the album, we went on tour in like spring early spring of 84 right when the record came out and um she was on bass so i think she would have been the bass player all the way to the end so we have this like great unit bill on drums kira on bass and that's an amazing rhythm section i mean those two together were just like you know amazing and you know gin is just at the top of his game i mean it was a really like there's just no it's just this predator animal on the serengeti i mean that that band collectively was a was a hyena it's just this you know killing machine just and we would go on tours and like play every night just like it was no nights off and it was just just the way you like it yeah but just a real and you have to remember we're all very young you know, you, we're, it's just like these people at their, just in their 20s where you're just, you never get tired and you can live in a van sleeping on top of the other person and eat, you know, half a meal and somehow get by. And nothing, you're kind of bomb-proof. In those days, you know, the venues you're playing, you're not treated all that well. Kind of anywhere you go, even Europe was kind of rough just because of Reagan Thatcher, just, you know, you have a lot of people telling you to get out of their country and all of this jazz. And so the tour was those songs. And partway through the tour, um, I think, it, yeah, partway through that tour, Slip It In came out. And this is when they would go in and record a ton, the marathon sessions. They would lock out total access for like four weeks of like, you know, 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. sessions or whatever we could afford without me they would just go like they don't you know don't bother and these are songs like sometimes i had never even heard them until you know like well, there was like well the in my head stuff the last record they just gave me a cassette one day i was like whoa what's this it's like just more otherwise we'd all be at band practice working on the songs and everything but um it was a really fruitful time. The Loose Nut record, the Slip It In record. There's just like song after song, Can't Decide, Black Coffee, boom, boom, boom. These songs are just falling out of Greg and Bill and Kira. And I'm writing lyrics, so yeah, everyone's contributing. So the set is changing. The sound of the band is changing. Um, we, the, the side two of My Wars, three slow songs. Uh, uh, nothing Left Inside. Uh, three nights and scream. I think of the three songs, and everyone talked. I'm like, "What's up with side two? Are you guys like a heavy metal band now?" Because like these three agonizingly slow songs and live, those songs were like terrifying, because they just would turn into like these eleven minute like ah, you know, just really heavy moments. And so so many people said, "What's up with side two? That we it was one of our better moments. Um, the tour t-shirt was the my war cover on the front the pettibone hand puppet with the knife and the all the back of the t-shirt said was side two <laughs> and that's um, good yeah it's really cool i'm forgetting some really cool independent music rock star came up to me in the last few years like someone i greatly admire i'm forgetting who it was and just came up and said hey man side two <laughs> i went and he went like thank you i'm like sure and and you can take, you know, what people say with a, the proverbial grain. But I've been told for many times in the in, for over the decades from bands of note, like, 
we were all in 10th grade and we snuck in to see you play in like Seattle or Denver or wherever. And we saw you guys play those songs. And that's why we, we formed our band. And that's why we play kind of big riffs and big medium tempo songs. That's the best. And these are, these are, these are like some big multi-platinum bands. And they said, we saw the, my war tour and we realized it's okay to play slow it's okay to play heavy. And if the crowd doesn't like it, screw them. And it was the My War tour where we saw you guys do that and went, okay, that's what we're going to do. Or we want to do something, have that in our, in our set somewhere. And I've heard that so many times from like bands. And I'm like, oh, well, thanks. I didn't write any of it. You know, it's, you know, it's all Greg and Chuck. But it's, it's interesting to hear some like seriously major musicians like say that. And then in, over the years, just like younger people come up and say, man, my war, like, how'd you guys have the guts to come up with that? I'm like, well, you know, Greg and Chuck, I, I take no credit for it at all. It's their songwriting. I wrote some lyrics, but you know, it's really those guys. And, and so it was an interesting time to be young, you know, around the time we made and released the record. It was an interesting time to be on tour in america because you've got reagan and the reagan effect is really present in america reagan was changing the landscape and i'm not here to, to bust on, on president reagan i have no hatred for the man whatsoever but you're seeing a change in law enforcement you're seeing just a drug and crime difference there's just more Things were changing, and for a band like Black Flag, things were getting more intense and potentially dangerous. Like specifically, and very purposefully, when the Olympics came to Los Angeles and they're exporting homeless folks to the, you know, to the edges of the earth so no one has to see them. And they're just like, on the bus, where are you taking us? D don't get on the bus. And, you know, cracking heads and moving things around. So every LA is like pretty for the world to come visit. That's so sick. Chuck Dukowski, who at that point is Black Flag's manager and booking agent, he said, okay, a band like Black Flag, if you guys are in town for the Olympics, you're part of the problem. So you're going to be out of California for the entire time the Olympics is getting set up, happening, and tearing down. So Smart. Yeah, and so he just said, it's summer we'd be touring anyway but he said you're not coming near california during the olympics and we all went wow and while that may sound to you now slightly hyperbolic like okay it's a little much in those days and and maybe we didn't have to be looking out who knows but no one in the band or road crew went what are you tripping chuck we all went wow damn chuck that's a good idea yeah well you guys got harassed a lot by yeah the cops. and i just didn't that wouldn't have gotten any better during that time and when you were and and so it was interesting touring around the time of of reagan the my war tour we called it the ken tour k-e-n kill everyone now and we had the meat puppets out with us who you know long hair which they would dye green and blue and they're playing you know, crazy jams every night. And our audience would, could be a very close-minded bunch where they didn't even like the songs we would play. Like, you know, like we would play like one of the slow songs from My War and people would be, I won't repeat the words they'd say, but you know, what, what not kind. And they'd get angry at the band for playing a slow song. And so they'd always punch the singer. I'm like, and I, I never said, well, he wrote it. I always just took the shot. But um, they would, we, we had a lot of hostile audiences, especially with the Meat Puppets opening. Like these three long hairs, uh, like incredibly talented. So talented. Though. So good. I'm shocked that people... So good. Well, you know, not everyone is going to see it your way. And there, you know, and it got to the point where my warm up for the show was going out and like finding a dark covert place and just waiting to either bounce someone or walk up and say throw one more bottle and you will never remember your mom's name <laughs> well you know you can't have 
a guy on stage playing guitar and having to dodge an ashtray. I mean, like when you throw something at a band, I'm done with you. Well, no, I like, agree. You, you now suffer the whirlwind. I, I mean, that that's not fair. I agree. And um, we were playing the 688 Club in Atlanta, Georgia. Sadly gone now. Um, 688 Spring Street. I think that's why they call it 688. Played a million shows there. And they had this elevated, kind of elevated seating area with a banister. So you could sit at a table and then you could, you know, beneath the like three, two feet down is like the walkway down to the dance floor. I'm lurking, watching the meat puppets. And I see a, a crushed beer can, like a hockey puck, sail through the air and like just graze one of the members of the band who like luckily didn't notice. And I'm like, okay, where's that coming from? And I see this college yahoo with like four crushed beer cans on his table. And his friends are all looking at him, like, you throw the next one. He's like the drunk idiot. I'm like, okay. So I'm looking at how am I going to bounce this guy? Well, I'm mean, going to use the, the guardrail banister thing as the fulcrum. And I'm going to use his own body weight to do this marvelous flip through the air. So if I grab him by his like hair, neck, shoulder, scruff of neck, shirt, jacket, and get his, at least like his rib cage to the banister and push hard enough, oh. I will be able to flip the rest of him over and he'll land like a sack of wet laundry on the ground. It'll probably really hurt if he falls on his keys. And he threw the next thing and it worked like, like a movie, like airborne wham. And everyone kind of went like, fantastic use of physics young mr rawlings well it is funny that you ha you thought that out. but you know well in those days you have to be resourceful <laughs> but um it was like that a lot you know where you'd come out like okay we have to drive to minneapolis and all the tires of the rider truck have been slashed like it was just brutal yeah and or you drive to the venue and they go oh you guys never confirmed the show so there's no show here tonight but then there's like a hundred people who showed up because it was on the mailing list that we mailed out. Oh. Like we were so undegether. Like Chuck didn't like finalize the show. So we're like, okay, can we play anyway? And you'd load in and do the show. Or there'd be a situation where it's a night off. Oh no, Chuck booked a show, but you guys didn't call from the Denny's pay phone a week ago and get the additional show. Okay, it's 6 p.m. and the show is 200 miles away. Okay, well, let's just floor it and speed with a rider truck and get there, load in <laughs> through the audience, set up and play. <laughs> or, oh, forgot to tell you that you're going to play in Providence in the evening, do an afternoon show and a night show in Boston. No, sorry. You're doing a night, uh, uh, like a, an 8 p.m. show in New York, but we forgot. We booked you in Providence for a later show, so you're going to pack up the gear and run up to like wherever it was, Rhode Island. The Meat Puppets, they'll finish their set and drive behind you. And by the time you're done, they'll arrive and, or they'll, sorry, they, they open, they run up, they'll open the show, you'll follow them, and you'll just use the club's PA that night because there won't be time to load in the Black Flag PA system. And, oh, and by the way, there's an afternoon show in Boston the next morning. And so if you look in, I think, in the Get in the Van book, there's a photo of Greg and I looking hollow-eyed through Jill Heath's camera lens because we have done three shows in three states in 24 hours. And you know, you're young, you can get through it. And That's a um, lot. immediately after that photo was taken, and I'm wearing that Ian McKay of minor threat t-shirt It's hilarious. I don't, I, I can't remember where I lost it. I had go, to go right to WBCN and do like a long interview because promote, promote, promote. And I just remember getting there like in the BCN van, just like, okay, doesn't feel like I'm a rock star. <laughs> And that's how those days were just because, you know, we were booked by, you know, we just, everything was crazy and people would vandalize your vehicle and the cops would get called or I would yell out the, like, uh, and I'd go, okay, uh, the guy with the aviator shades, he's a narc because there'd be like plainclothes cops that are at our shows all the 
<laughs> and I'd always call them out from the stage. You'd see the guy look around. And I was like, you narc. And he'd always like, you know, have to skedaddle. And so those days were really, really intense and tense. Plus, the band didn't, we didn't get along all that well. We were really good at what we did. Like Bill and I, we would hang out a lot because we both would, would would train for tours. Like we'd go out like for weeks before a tour and like like run like up to like two hours a night all through the South Bay because at night everyone goes home and you have like the entirety of Redondo Beach to yourself. Where would you guys jog? Um, uh, Prospect. Yeah. Um, by Miracosta, we'd use mm-hmm. that hill. That's and a then, brutal hill. Yeah, totally. And then we would drive over. What's the st- street that, that goes like above the beach? Sepulveda, right? All the big shops are on yes, it. The big, I, the big yeah, Dunkin' yeah, Donuts. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. We would run up and down that. Because if you start at Manhattan Beach and go towards Redondo Hermosa, it kind of goes up and down. Yeah. And then so you would go down and then bust a left and go back up into the numbered streets, which are just like mountain goat uphill. And so we would just... Because that's Bill was born and raised around there. So he'd go, okay, Hank, make a left. And we would just do these epic runs because we were like 22, 23. And we would run for like two, two and a half hours. Come on. From like, well, we'd do like 10 milers, no problem. Because you're young. And we were like in amazing shape. And we would start at midnight, no carbon monoxide. And we would run and like not see a car. You know that neighborhood. Yeah. Everyone goes to bed. It's sleepy at night. Yeah, and w- there'd be nothing but cops, you know, just slowly patrolling the neighborhood. And so we were like in insane shape for those tours, me and Bill. So Bill and I had that kind of camaraderie. I feel like Bill's the guy everyone liked. Oh, B- Bill's he's a such sweetheart. such a sweet guy. Yeah, he's a great guy, and he's a good man, honest to a fault, yeah. and like just an amazing musician, can play every instrument on stage and produce your record. And, and sing on key. But anyway, Bill and I had a thing because we we're the two sweat machines in that band, like Lake Bill and Lake Lake uh, Rollins. We, you know, he would like sweat out the drum stool and I'd leave this lake puddle in front of the, the, the stage. And so we had that in common. We're like the two guys who are going to lose like four pounds of water weight a night and like try not to vomit. But otherwise, we didn't really hang out together there's no we we just were really good at playing but otherwise everyone would find a corner of the van or the truck and just put their headphones on and just kind of grind their teeth away from the others and pre-show i'm always going to record stores and bookstores all day greg would go on one of his like nine mile power walks and i don't know what the rest of them would get up to but um we always just kind of leave each other alone because you know you're in a small van, you're in small backstage areas, you're sleeping at somebody's house at night, like on a floor or in the back of the van to have some quiet. And so the proximity level, yeah, it's too much together. It, it's time. it's intense, yeah. and there's not always a shower, so it's a, you know you're <laughs> like okay, I know way too much about you. And so I wouldn't say a contempt started to grow, but just kind of a tension that we were all aware of that we knew that okay to get it's through fatigue. this it's fatigue yeah because we did everything too much like so many shows without any break and when you're not doing shows you're songwriting and there, there's like five or six band practices a night I mean it was just full court press and that's where I learned my work ethic I learned it in the minimum wage working world but I really got it from Greg and Chuck because they're just you thought you were a hardworking person and you just watched these two guys just whoop your ass work. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, they just, you know, <laughs> they just, they were going to make it work. SST Records and Black Flag were going to get over the wall. And if you're pulling 20 hour shifts to do it, those two guys, they didn't even flinch. I mean, I've never seen anything like those guys. And I always tr- strove to be that way and to this day. And, you know, that tour ended in December of 84 with St. Vitus opening another amazing oh, cool. essay. Oh, so great. And getting to see them every night was such an honor. I'd never missed a show because like, why would you? They're so amazing. So I got to see them play like at least 50 times in my life. So lucky. And um, that tour ended right around Christmas, around 84. And by 85, um, Bill is gone and in comes Anthony and the 
the, the just the band changed again. Greg has other songs, and the thing morphs into this new thing. And it was never that lean, mean, and nihilistic <laughs> again. So I don't think we with that lineup we ever played mo- the song "My War" again. It was loose nut, slip it in. It was the the next big batch of songs of of, of Greg Ginn. Uh, and so that was that was a 84 was the, the year but again coming back around 82 was when those songs started getting written and here's another bit of trivia that a lot of black flag fans might not know there's a song called slip it in from the album slip it in that was from circa late summer 82 and I remember the first time we played it was at in San Pedro at Dancing Waters, kind of a, a small venue, and it had a different lyric. And the lyric, the song title was "Always Thinking They're Right," and it was uh, like a political song about authority, is Gin lyric. And I think it's like da 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 da, always da 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 da, thinking da da da, they're right da 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 da, and that and it it morphed into. Uh, the songs, the, the lyric, all of a sudden I'm handed a new brief. Like, here's the new lyric. I guess he didn't like it or didn't like how I was singing it. But I think that got rolled out as that lyric one time, one time only. And I'm, you know, I have searched all my boxes of stuff over and over again for that lyric. Because I usually would keep the lyric sheet because it's, you know, I, ha- I need to learn the song. And I don't have it. And I'm just wondering why I don't have it. Just because, like, maybe Greg took it back. I, I don't know. I, I can't think I would have lost it. But, I don't um, know. You might come across it. You never know. But uh, I just remember that one night because we just kind of rehearsed it up and did it. And that was that. But um, that's an, just kind of an interesting... It just kind of speaks to how quickly Greg was just cranking out songs coming to the end of a of a of a train of thought like the songs are like like this and now it's going to be like this and he would turn a corner and we would all be with him because like we're the band and suddenly you're given a whole new set of lyrics and you're in the practice room hearing this new music and you know wow this is so different than what we were doing six months ago and the audience kind of got used to songs they'd never heard or songs they had just the record had just come out never returning to no value six pack TV party and then never returning to my war can't decide. They just, we were just burning through material because of Greg's just, he was so prolific and the ethos was new, new songs, new songs, new songs, which I instilled with the Rollins band. Um, The my war album, the my war point of view and the my war tour It was that band who had many lineups. It was that band at its most feral, and that's a fair word to use. It's most lean and mean. It's the four piece. It's not the two guitar lineup, which was great. But you have this cut, chiseled four piece with like this, you know, drummer who is unexhaustible. Kira, who's just one of the better bass players anywhere, anytime. And a guitar player who is just, so unique maybe at the top of his powers and a 23 year old singer with no sense of exhaustion everyone in the band flooring it just like because when you're young you forget you know only older people can tell you about what it's like to be young because when you're young you're just too busy being young you don't know anything about restraint you just all you know is pedal to the metal and that's how every show of that 84 tour was. I mean, it was just gnarly where sometimes Bill and I would look at each other like, how are we doing this? I mean, you're kind of, when you're that age, you're kind of superhuman for nine to 15 months because you're just so young and the the energy level is just, you know, you never get it back. I mean, you're never that way a year later. You, You peak, you start to feel it. And that was those people kind of at, at a really peak time in their lives with these amazing songs and a, a real attitude 
you know, because in England and Germany in the 84 summer tour, we had like guys seek heiling us and throwing the pint mugs. Oh, and brother. the summer tour in England, I went to a hardware store with my own per diems and bought an axe handle <laughs> without, without the axe, without the metal part, because it's built to be swung. It's balanced to be swung like a baseball bat, but it grips better. And I would come on stage for every show in England and put my axe handle down on the drum riser. You're just letting everyone know? Just like, right? Are we clear? Because <laughs> um, I'd been, you know, punched out and knocked out before by skinheads in England previous tours. And so there was that in Germany, England, and in the lower, the southern part of America. Florida, Texas, you have a lot of these really scary, super capable guys showing up. And so... In the band, that became kind of part of our, you know, just part of your wiring. Like every day there's going to be, something's going to break out. Why was it you guys? Because, you know, big reputation and someone, everyone assumed that we had a big open mouth and so you have at least three boneheads coming to shut it for Well, I think you were very menacing. You were. Well, and you know, we we were coming on with it. And, you know, I, I, I will never, I can't any of my any bad behavior i may have engaged in or probably did i can't defend it you know all i can say is young stupid and hostile but look what i'm up against every night and i'm not trying to excuse any bad behavior but like you see that there's like that video that never goes away oh, of, of me God. like you know be, pummeling that guy well well no no me being mean to the fanzine kid oh i can't even watch that right but you, it's so upsetting because that is not the henry i know but but what you're seeing and I, i'm not trying to forgive myself it's an excusable behavior i owe the guy an apology but what you're seeing is what the effect of that compression and that life on the road that's how what you become and again I, i'm not trying to say oh, no i think that kid got the misplaced anger but from that's you. you said it perfectly like he got the the nine buckets of spit <laughs> And the ashtray sailing by my head and the skinhead girl saying, my boyfriend's coming to the show to beat you up tonight. Okay. And then, you know, meeting the guy later and having to like, you know, swing on at him. He got that. So what I'm saying is that's what that environment turned us into, you know, and I'm not, and, and all of us, maybe not Bill so much cause he's just too much of a, a nice guy. And not nice in a bad sense. Just like, you know, he's just, he's everyone he's like that person. guy. He's a good person. But you can't not be in that environment and not get a little on you. And if you're the front man in that band, you're going to get some on you every night. Like I get dragged off stage, held down and kicked just because, you know, someone wants to have a go. And, you know, there I am sitting with fake ID in the, you know, the clinic in Atlanta with a bunch of people handcuffed to their seats with a a cop with them waiting to get my head sutured. And and then finally someone comes in, hey, we got to make the drive to wherever we got to go. So, okay. So I just had to just close it as best I could because it wasn't time to get the stitches. And so I became a product of that to a certain degree. And I obviously, I bought in, you know, like, okay, fine it's a jungle well then i'll just be i'll just get in there with it and by december of 1984 i was a really kind of a very negative person and then by 86 the environment had gotten very toxic and to this day i am still so i can't walk anything back because you can't undo anything i am still apologizing or like i get an email at least an email a month Hey man, I just found out about, I saw, I heard your podcast or whatever. So I heard you on Rogan and I looked, what's up with you and this kid, <laughs> the fam? Like, I know. I go, man, I, I, I know. you gotta be old like me. I, it would take me an hour and a half to drag you back to 1984 yeah. and walk you through it. And I can't defend it. But all I can do is try and say, you should have been there. It yeah. wouldn't have seemed like bad behavior at the time. <gasps> There's so much violence night to night. And you'd meet like really scary guys who would like kind of lurk in the parking lot all day, like the guy with a swastika on his face. 
you know, oh, who just God. like stood there all day and just kind of lurked around. And you're like, okay, this is just a hard environment to be in. And so it was just, you know, an indie band who was famous for, well, the local cops came and the undercover cops came and the local municipal person came and channel seven came and the, the church group came and, and there was a stabbing that night and, uh. and, 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 and that was us. Yeah, that was us. And so, um, there was a lot of, you know, you, you, there, it, a lot of it was, you know, there was a lot of notoriety and badassery, but it, it came with, you know, some undercover cop running into your dressing room after the show like looking for the drugs and you wanted to tell him pal if we had the money who knows what we'd be on but um or like you know you're you're satanist that's what the the the, the church people coming like you're satanist i said uh, I, I would my running joke was pal if we we're in if we could find satan we'd cook him and eat him for lunch we're so hungry <laughs> like, like like boy if, if he had any meat on his bones me and bill would, would turn him into jerky and so Black Flag tours were never that way going forward. And so it was an interesting time to be 20-something. Um, really interesting with this album that a lot of your fans didn't even like. A lot of people, you know, they, they that the My War record made them mad. They just got pissed off at side two. So it was, a, it was one of those records that really divided people. Some people said, best record you've ever made. Like, wow, terrifying. Like, what a tour. And other people are like, you guys have lost it. You're just a dumb metal band. Where does it rate with you? Oh, as far as intent and execution and intensity, I think it's the best thing Black Flag ever did. Um, it, I mean, I just think it's in its own way a slice of genius, mainly because of Greg's guitar playing and the, the composition. I, I, I never count myself in it. But as far as like the statement that band made, I think it's my war. And if anything, it's the song. The uh, sound of the jackhammer must mean it's time for another installment of Heidi's Headline. All right, Heidi May, what do you have for Here us you this go, time? Henry. Here you go. <clears throat> Henry says he's only allowed to drink Perrier on the weekends because it's two dollars a <laughs> bottle. Well, yeah, it's a lot of Henry. money. It's an insult to money. It's an insult to working for a living to drink a $2 bottle of water, except on the weekends. But here's the thing. Yeah? I came into the office, and one day there was probably about 30 bottles of it. Yes, because they dropped the price down to $1.25 <laughs> a bottle, and I went big. I went to uh, Gelson's. I went in there. I was jet lagging. I got in there at like you know 8 a.m. on a Sunday, and I was like, oh! <gasps> And I went back out to my, my mighty Mazda 6 and I got an extra Trader Joe's bag so I could load up. And I started buying eight bottles at a time, figuring they might change the price before I got to the cash register. And then I started going in every night buying eight bottles. And by at some point, I had like 32 bottles of Perrier. Out in, on the counter. Yeah, in rows. But Green soldiers waiting to deploy refreshment <laughs> no, night after night. Were, and just so you know, they were all lime. There was no grapefruit for me. But anyway. I'll um, buy some grapefruit. But you won't drink a $2 bottle of Perrier each day. You only have it on the weekends. But yeah. you'll buy a $10,000 acetate. <laughs> and I'm all for you buying these Thanks. things. Thanks. You I'm work glad you're hard. On board. Thanks. And you're, you're, you're taking care of these things. Sure. Sure. For the future. Super duper. Yeah, but that means that you can drink Perrier every day. Wow. Well, and next Heidi, time it's on sale, grapefruit. Heidi, just so you know, I'll buy you some. I'll, I'll go to the damn grocery <laughs> store tonight. I'll get you some some Perrier. <laughs> you know the Edvard Munch painting? That's me. That's Henry Silent Scream. That's how he's... I do it all the time. That's Tell him what that She'll is. She'll say, we need to get a dog for the office. That's his a inside scream. A huge poodle. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have room here. We will end up with a dog one day. No, we won't. Yeah, the office needs a dog. It does. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. The, the place will smell like a dog. It'll be covered in dog hair. <laughs> oh, no, there's these shedless breathing and don't there shed are. a single hair. Yeah, their entire, water dogs, yeah. yeah, their entire life, freeze. not one hair falls off them. No, they don't. You shed. 
I, I do shed. There's your hair all over oh, this so place. So sad. I'm losing my hair. It's because of you. Mm. I've noticed there's a lot of hair of mine in your car because the way you drive, it falls out because you're such a scary uh, driver. Okay, here's what. That I look on the ground. Every and once in a while, hair. when there's I no literally... traffic, because Heidi will scream. It's the best sound. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just jam the wheel. I'll go like, like, like. 10 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 9 o'clock. And then she's like, stop! And you just, you cackle, and I'm flying oh, around the car. so great. Hence the hair, and my she hair. she bobs around like a blonde light bulb head. <laughs> bing, boom, bing, bing, bing. And the hair goes everywhere. It's like taking a hamster and shaking it. I already have sad thin hair. Oh, it's so funny. And you make it worse. The sound. Oh, the sound is fantastic. Every <laughs> Sometimes I've been actually filming when it's happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see the this the the all of a sudden it's wavy cam. Hey, whoa, <laughs> wow, folks! I don't, you know, there's not a lot of people in my life. It's just Heidi May and the occasional visit from people like Ian Sfinonius and. Uh, Ian Mackay. Ian Mackay. Brendan from Eddie Current. Uh, Engineer X will come by every once in a while. And that's kind of it, really. I don't know many that's people. That's the way you like it. And so I have to keep myself amused. And so <laughs> any way I can, I can get <laughs> Heidi May to jump up and down and go, <laughs> I do it. Because that's, that's what I'm all about. Oh, you're such a kook. Ah. Hey, you know what? And Aww. the crowd went wild. Well... The crowd, the crowd were mildly amused. The crowd politely applauded our efforts. The crowd, and you even doing like this, it doesn't make it sound that enthusiastic. Basically, they're so happy we're done, and they're thinking about, oh, did I validate the parking? Are we going to have to pay the babysitter overtime? Shush. Okay, so that was the podcast. The applause, the, the, it's just podcast listener... It's this just, is a long It's podcast. just you and me and Heidi May and the cleanup crew. There's no one here but us. And Thank you for listening. And we'll be back with you next time. There's yes? one more thing present. What? Oh, no!